Hello everyone and welcome to the LARP Tales podcast. My name is Oliver. I am one half of your hosting duo. With me, as always, is my co-host Robin. And our guest on today's show, joining Robin and myself, is Andy Raff. Andy is the lead writer over at Profound Decisions. Profound Decisions being the company that makes the Empire LARP Fest system here in the UK. Andy gives us an insight into the writing of plot and game rules and what goes into writing all those winds of fortune and winds of war. Before that though, if you are watching us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, click that subscribe. If you are new here, leave us a comment down below, share this video around. If you're listening on an audio platform such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please feel free to leave us a five-star review. That just helps people find us. We also do have a Patreon if you do wish to support us in that way go and check that out you are of course under no obligation to do so you are perfectly welcome to enjoy our podcast episodes for totally free and with that all out of the way let's get into our conversation with andy hello everyone welcome to the larp tales podcast robin and myself are joined by andy how are you doing andy welcome to the show Hello, good to be here. Right, Andy. Um, I think you're better off explaining what your what your role is within <laughs> Profound Decisions and the Empire LARP. Well, you have a joke about the fact that that several of us don't actually have job titles. Um, but uh, basically, I I kind of run the campaign is one way of looking at. It. I help write the game, set it up. Uh, but my day to day job mostly involves doing things like writing Winds of War, uh, Winds of Fortune, working with plot writers to develop the plots that are going to run at events and things like that, with a tiny side order of posting things on Facebook because nobody else can be trusted to. Uh, and that is basically whatever that is, is what my, my job description is. Um, that and being called into meetings about hit points at two o'clock in the morning when somebody's had a brainwave uh, is kind of what I do. Right. I'm part of the game team. So, uh, so, so going going way back, how how on earth did you end up writing for a LARP game for a living? I mean, how much history do you want? Uh, <laughs> go, hey, it's, if we can it started in the eighties with it's Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, a lot um, of these no. geeky gaming stories start in the eighties. You know, uh, it started in the eighties with Dungeons and Dragons, basic, not advanced. Uh, but when I went to university, I joined our uh, the tabletop gaming club. I was introduced to live role playing. Uh, in a system that I would describe as terrible, really didn't like it at all, <laughs> and as is often the case, and this is a common thread with lots of people I've spoken to who've ended up running LARPs, so I was so annoyed with how bad the LARP was, I wrote my own, Yeah, well, uh, and we played that for a while, Yeah, and then we played some Vampire LARP, because it's getting on in the 90s and Vampire is popular, yeah. and I didn't like that, so I wrote my own, um, and then we did a couple of fest systems. Um, as a sort of like a large extended friends group, we didn't entirely enjoy them, and I was starting to write my own when, thank God, uh, Omega, uh, the Phoenix campaign, which uh, Matt Pennington was heavily involved in, mm -hmm. came along, and we did that for a few years. And then when that ended, uh, Maelstrom, which was the yeah. first uh, Profound Decisions game, came along. Um, so I played that for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, I played a Samurai Badger. Uh, don't ask. <laughs> Uh, and then <laughs> my group kind of it didn't it didn't fail but, but it came to a natural ending point. Uh, I was planning to play a a newspaper man who would stand on a box and shout because that is one of my fundamental personal skills is the ability to shout in a box. But Matt emailed and said, "Do you want to come and run plot for Maelstrom? You'll have a budget and a cast of NPCs. will do what you tell them." And I thought, well, "Yeah, sounds like the sort of thing I'll enjoy." Um, and so I got increasingly involved in Maelstrom. And then as that started to get really creaky at around the seven year mark or so, um, and then Odyssey came along around that point, we had a candid chat about Maelstrom and decided to put a bullet between its eyes and work on an actual game. Uh, and we spent a couple of years working on that and then Empire. Hooray. And that's how I ended up writing, writing for helping to run Empire. So Mostly that. So you started early. I mean, it does, it does sound a little bit like people who, who run their own, D, D games or whatever it's like i i really want i'm not getting what i want out of the games i'm playing so i'll just run my own game and that's how people end up just being dms or game designers um i basically homebrewed my way into being uh, the campaign director for empire <laughs> so, you've been, so you've been writing laps for 
a, a while then. And you've only just you've only just recently like officially joined the the PT the PD team as well, right? Oh, like, let me think how. So it's about six. Or, it's not that recently. It's like six, yeah. seven years ago now mm-hmm. um, that uh, we came on full time when the company was at a position to be able to uh, have full time employees, mm-hmm. uh, which is, as I understand it, ultimately the goal. Yeah, um, to take more people on. Um, because you're going to do so much with volunteers, and you should only do too much with volunteers, but that's not entirely my area. Yeah, I'm happy to exploit volunteers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, you, you, you've kind of you've kind of got it. Well, they're volunteering, well. right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. uh, yeah. But that brings with it, um, the boss is much better at talking about this sort of stuff. That brings with it an onus to make sure that the experience the volunteer is getting uh, is good, same as the players, because running plot or NPCing or being members of the skirmish team um, are these people's hobby. Mm-hmm. And we shouldn't lose sight of that, uh, which is why, you know, I, honestly, it sounds like I'm uh, tooting our own horn, but why Matt in particular makes a lot of effort to make sure that people are fed and watered and, and rested and have an input and that we listen uh, and we don't treat them like uh, like sides of beef. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I've I been mean, there. Like every, I know what every, that's like. <laughs> like every time we've spoken to anyone who has been like volunteering and stuff for Empire, they have kind of said like, well, they always seem to really enjoy themselves and they seem to always be trying to encourage other people to come and do it. And if they weren't getting treated well, then they wouldn't be encouraging others to come and join them the way that they are. So no, it is definitely quite clear that they are treated like people, really. <laughs> we, do, we, we do our best. I could tell you horror stories, but I'm not going to because they're still... <laughs> Legal restrictions on some of the games I have crewed in the uh, in the ancient past. I am joking, but I would just, uh, we've so, come a long way since the uh, yeah. since the nineties. Yeah. So what about so what about like um, player experience things like that? Did did you like play and crew in games that you were writing for, or did you uh, at some point went right? I'm going to stop playing. So games now? since the very start, since what? So I started running a linear system. I, I see. I've never. I'm never sure these days if anybody's familiar with a linear system. No, you know what? I, I just explain it because because a lot of people jump into LARP, uh, either parlor or they end up doing fest LARPs. At, at it used popular. to be one of the two mainstream. You mentioned mm-hmm. parlor, but but linear was uh, in our particular case our university uh, live action role playing society uh, would get together alternate Saturdays at various uh, landmarks around the northeast of England, uh, and we would essentially run on rails experiences in which you walked uh you had a hike uh and there were fights and role-playing encounters at roughly 10 minute intervals along the path um oh god i started when we were still battle boarding um which is when there would be a ref who would have all your stats on a character sheet yeah. and after every fight would fill in how many hit points you'd taken and scratch off any one of the abilities you'd used um which was partly to keep the rules straight and mostly to give the monster crew um, who were the other half of the player team, time to run ahead and set up the next encounter. Uh, and we did that for a couple of years, and I played in that. We had other people writing, uh, but it was nothing like the kind of systems uh, we went on to run because it didn't matter that you were both playing and running. Uh, but since then, I mostly don't play the games that I'm running, um, but I do. I have been to the odd player event, mm-hmm. for example, where I'm able to just kick back and watch other people running them. Um, I had a lot of fun just at the start of the pandemic, just before it started, uh, going up to Glasgow, uh took my civil servant who is mostly just a a, a gloss for the fact that i edit the wiki and was terrible at people at a table while having a nice meal and that is my ideal larp game these days (laughs) i've been terrible at people while having a nice meal (laughs) so when you so when you came on board for empire what was your what was your like contribution as a writer to actual (laughs) game design because i like i'm not i'm I, I don't really so, have um, any clue about game design, but I mean... It's assuming... going back a little way now. Um, mm-hmm. Matt and I, Matt sort of invited me to work with him to develop the next game. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were very keen on the idea. Um, prior to that, we'd both um, we'd both worked roughly the same way, and it's the way a lot of people work at the time, which we'd, we'd have a good idea, and then we'd tack a live role-playing game onto it. Yeah. Uh, but Matt was really keen for us to start, get back to brass tacks and talk about things like what would players do, what would the player experience be, how is LARP different to tabletop role playing? Um, and not just try and create a live action Dungeons and Dragons, which is the easy way to do it. Uh, so we spent a lot of time on the phone, uh, talking about concepts and ideas. We were, co- we were a fair distance through Maelstrom, which was very heavily about uh, experimenting with player freedom as an idea. Okay. We've let players do everything. Almost everybody at Maelstrom was a player. Uh, the game was very plot light. Um, and all of the game, more or less, 
certainly for the first five or six years came from the interaction between the players. But that had problems of its own that we identified. Uh, Knives Out PvP is not for everybody and it can be really disruptive to an ongoing campaign when one major group kills everybody in another. Um, so we had a lot of those. We set up some forums. We brought some more people we'd worked with before on board. We kicked some ideas around and then Matt and I wrote a setting and codified all the rules and things along those lines with various other uh, recruited volunteers writing sections of the game. And then we take those and edit them and and stick bits in, take bits out and make sure they slotted in. Uh, we were still writing, let me think, the Conclave, the Thursday night before the first Empire session. Uh, I mean, it was all it was all it was all finished, it was all, kind yeah. of, but yeah, we were okay. still. I can remember being in a freezing cold tent, wearing two jumpers, madly typing up how all of the uh, how the Conclave worked, which was nothing like how it worked the time before we changed it. Most recently, it was really? completely different at the start of the game. Not very great. Uh, so yeah, so I did a lot of that. My personal big contributions is, I think, with very minimal exceptions, I did all the rituals, magic items, and potions. All the oh, wow. what you call tech stuff, all the bits that yeah. make magic and rituals and things work. They have my fingerprints all over them, sadly. <laughs> so, like the the look and the feel of the empires is now. Was it was it how it is where how it is now when you first conceived it, or did it, it change a lot in the? I'm trying to think what we what we lost. It's mostly where it started. Really, um, there was a there was a meeting I think in a in Matt's little portable office thing that he had at Maelstrom with um, with some costume designers as well, yeah. uh, where we talked about the traditional looks and feels for Festlarp. Mm -hmm. And we also talked about the things people like playing. Right. Um, I think the only notion I can think of that has fundamentally shifted a little bit was the Brass Coast, yeah. which when it started was much more um, 12th century Spain, and it has shifted a little bit more eastwards uh, as yeah. time has gone. But they were broadly, I think, roughly the same. Um, they were initially all identified by sort of keywords. Navarre, for example, was wood elf, uh, because right. that that visual of leather and and uh, and tooling and things was a, is a very strong festal art look. Mm -hmm. um, and we spent a certain amount of time talking about things we didn't want. We didn't want Vikings, for example. Uh, we didn't want. Um, uh, we didn't want arrows. We didn't want eastern. We focused heavily on uh, on a kind of not Europe precisely, but we had a very clear geographical and historical idea that we wanted to try and stick to as much as possible. And I think the one that errs most out of that is probably Urizen. Yeah. Uh, but that is a much quite intentionally a much more fantasy nation inspired by high elves uh, yeah. more than and Jedi, but mostly high elves and Jedi. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's a good sort of like concept way of doing it though, like thinking about like what do people want to be? Some people, like you say, want to be wood elves. Some people want to, you know, be Jedi. Some people want to do these sort of things. And um, I mean, when I've been trying to get people into Empire, I've literally just been like, oh, what do you like? What are you into? Oh, you like that character? Well, this nation, you could pretty much be that character. And it's a, it's a good way because all the nations are just so different and there's for something for everyone it is it's really unique a lot of it was inspired by experiences we'd had uh i wasn't directly involved with odyssey um but odyssey had said here are the five nations you play at odyssey and they have very clear visual uh differentiation between them and some of them were quite ambitious the greek look for example is not one that many larpers have lying around in their cupboard yet turned out to be the biggest nation uh, which felt like a validation of the idea that if people are excited about what you're presenting to them, they will make the effort to try and bring that to life. And you see that all the time. Dawn is an obvious example. Uh, when you get a large group of Dornish people together, they are full plate and packing steel or beautiful flowing costumes in bright colours, uh, really bring that that sort of Arthurian core of the visual to life in a way that is really, really, it's great. I love it. I love seeing that stuff. Yeah, it, it feels like it feels like 10 like 10 different games, right? Because a lot of people ask me why I chose Dawn. And for me personally, like I came to Empire, I wanted to play Empire because of Dawn. Like the, like I was like, I didn't go, I know, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people go, oh, yeah, I want to play Empire. Um, but for me, I was like, no, I saw I saw Dawn and what I could do in Dawn and went, no, I want to go to that game because I can play that. Was that like the, the idea from what like you... So that, that concept creates some interesting challenges. Certainly... Um, one of the traditional ways of doing large-scale LARP is to have a number of factions, each of whom most will have their own faction plot, 
that is for their faction, but there'll be certain points over the course of weekend where they come together for a battle or uh, or two plot writer teams will get together. We intentionally didn't do that because ultimately we wanted an empire, a field in which there are 10 separate groups of people, but they all have a shared pot of resources in front of them, if you will. And that's fundamentally what the empire is. They're all invested in this same thing, so they can't afford to be separate. So we also don't use faction plot teams. We have a single centralized one. That can cause problems because sometimes a nation can feel overlooked because they don't see enough plot being aimed in their direction. But the advantage is that when somebody pitches a plot to us, they will often talk about how this is, uh, to use an example, this plot is about a standing stone in the marches that has gone awry and is messing with things in the vicinity. And here is how we are going to expand that plot to potentially draw in other people. Uh, it might pull in Verushkins because there's a strong curse element. And they are the people who are often identified in the player mindset with examining curses. Uh, there is a Dornish knight that's gone missing in the vicinity, so it can pull in some Dornish players. Uh, and as much as possible when we're building a plot, we aim them at the field um, and hope that they will bounce around and drag in people from all over the place. Because the idea that a plot is for uh, one group of people is kind of opposed to our whole... Uh, game design ethos because at the end of the day everybody's in a part of the empire yeah no like it really it, it does work like that way but i didn't even actually quite put all that together before because um i had a hat before i was night protector of winter and i'm on one of my skirmishes i was like um i was like i'm just gonna take a little daughter she'll be fine and then i started doing all the research into what the skirmish was what we had to do and i was like no i need somebody from urzen because of this and it'd be really good if i had some barushkins for that part of it and i ended up having a skirmish that ended up having about six different nations involved in it and i didn't go in intentionally doing that and then coming out of it at the end create all these friends all these connections and all these sort of groups of people coming together and it's like that you know you see that all over you go to a random tavern in the marchers and you see <laughs> mixtures of all the nations and you can just stand there and everyone's working together for the most part <laughs> it works so um, well. matt talks about it a little bit he talked about it a lot early on but, it, but again it's one of our founding principles which is the idea uh pvp everybody knows about player versus player but Matt is really interested in player with player, uh, which encompasses PvP because it essentially means we want to encourage players to interact with each other. It doesn't matter whether they're trading, arguing, fighting, cooperating, uh, dancing, whatever, but it's about getting groups of players to interact with each other because of maths. Because uh, we have 30 NPCs for 3,000 player field, uh, whereas we have 3,000 players, so we can motivate them to make game for each other uh, we can put our feet up and drink banana daiquiris. Uh, <laughs> it's the dream. Yeah. Um, I mean, was there other games running? Like, because I don't, I don't really know how some of the other bigger LARP systems abroad work, but because they do seem very like faction, like you say that it seems very much like it's you know horde versus alliance type thing. Is there any, or, or was that something you kind of went, we're going to try it out and see? if it works or not. So um, we both, uh, not so much me, but certainly some other members of the volunteer team had a much more experience of playing in that more traditional kind of fest lot. They played um, the Lorien Trust game and, uh, and Curious Pastimes in this country with people who regularly went to the German uh, larger fest. I think it's Drakenfels. Drak Drakenfest, yeah, yeah, something like yeah. that. Drakenfest. Yeah. And they are fine mm -hmm. uh that sounds that sounds terrible doesn't it uh no, no, it doesn't, they, they no do, doesn't. <laughs> pd number one they, they do a different kind of experience we yeah. um all the way back to omega the game that matt didn't run but was heavily involved in running that i played all the way through the drive has been and is carried on through profound decisions to try and uh i don't want to say player led because it's become such a buzzword but to try and reduce the power of the organizers and non-player characters over the direction the the game takes uh and what that does is create a huge amount of additional work it is certainly a lot easier to run a game in which you know who's going to turn up at, to the sentinel gate at six o'clock and what they're going to do um whereas every time a skirmish runs uh at our game there is that brief moment of all right is anybody going to turn up have we just sent the uh, the skirmish team out into the freezing cold, muddy woods to hide in ditches 
and we're going to have to send somebody running out to go and get them again because, for example, the brass coast has identified that it's better if this skirmish fails than if it succeeds because their ultimate political goal is to get this Jotun they're supposed to be rescuing killed uh, as easily as possible. That is a made-up example, but it does skirt quite close to things that have actually happened. Um, uh, and it's scary. It's scary to give players that level of freedom over the game and over the direction that it takes. I, do you feel like you're hitting a stride with it now that looks to what you'll have like 10 years of play in or something? So um, the for me, certainly in hindsight, the proof of concept success was when the people of Wintermark decided to cede the territory of Skarsen to the Imperial Orcs as a homeland. Because uh, we, we had nothing to do with that. Uh, that was literally nothing to do with us. And those photos of the Wintermark senators being carried out of the Senate at shoulder height are kind of like a validation of the idea that you can have a great game if you leave the players as much as possible to get on with making up their own stories and uh, and doing their own political manoeuvres. And we've seen a lot of stuff since then, but that's the moment, I think, at which it really crystallised that the game was going to work and that people were going to do things and that we were going to be hit by unexpected occurrences um that we would have to react to and i like that challenge it is so much easier than just writing the same back to linear again uh often the only decision i was making on linear quests was whether the bandit encounter was going to be the first or the second encounter uh and how that would go with the wandering uh, with the wandering merchant encounter uh and that is certainly not what the case is the case is when we're running empire yeah i i guess i guess it's become you become more i, I guess it's more like um I guess it's more like fiction writing when you're writing things like plot for a big game because like when you're writing for a small game you you've got you're thinking about a certain number of people but when it gets to thousands of people I imagine you've just got to be like well I'm just going to write you know what I think you know I can't cater to every single person in this position can I <laughs> We, it's interesting you mentioned that way, way back at the very beginning after we'd done some of our basic work and, and sort out what we're going to run with the game, uh, which I often tell people used to be called Dritten Spiel uh, and be spelled out entirely in penguins, uh, which is which is what our code name was it for when it started was Dritten Spiel. And then it was Republic for a while. Uh, and then it was Revolution for a while. And then it ended up as Empire and they made me take my exclamation mark off the end, which I still haven't forgiven anybody for. Um <laughs> We we went in. right into it. We're not going to put it back in, don't worry. <laughs> I think Empire is great, but other people with less less spirit than I uh, won that argument. Yeah. Um, we ha One of the things we did that, again, is, is a little different, I think, is we said um, most festlop systems, many festlop systems, uh, are much more open in terms of what you can play and how you can play it and what you can do on the field. Yeah. And we said right from the beginning, we've got an empire with 10 nations in it, and you will play a group in one of those nations. There's no, I come from a little island outside the empire and I'm unique and special and I make my own nation. We said, you will pay these 10 things. Um, you will not be able to play civil servants. The magistrate roles will be NPCs. The egregores will not be nation leaders and they will also be NPCs and things. And that and that resulted in a little bit of kickback. I, I, uh, yeah. but, but Matt was very clear. Uh, Matt was very clear. Uh, that we were running Empire and you could play Empire or you could play a different game. Um, we weren't going to write a game that was designed to appeal to everybody. If you don't like social and political rivalries and that kind of game, Empire can be difficult for you. Mm -hmm. um, if you want constant threat and fighting, um, again, Empire is not the game for you. We don't do camp attacks. The field is almost it is mostly safe. Um, and that comes through into every area. We don't, uh, we're not unaware of the fact there's 3,000 players and we want to try and get them engaged, but we mostly do that by throwing double handfuls of skittles into the room, uh, or revels actually might be a better example, double handfuls of revels into the room and hoping that people will find a flavour of revel that they enjoy. Yeah. Um, it's one of the key roles that the Winds of Fortune, uh, for example, play, where they are a plot of the game, but they are aimed at a level where anybody who wants to or who becomes interested in them more uh, can find ways to get involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, again, a, diff a slightly different way of running plot uh, to more traditional yeah. large-scale LARPs. How, how, much of, how, how much of that wiki have you actually written? Because <laughs> it is... Oh. <laughs> I've no idea. I used to say, it's less true than it used to be. I used to say I've either written or edited mm -hmm. every page. 
accept the costume creation pages because they are so far outside my wheelhouse, it's untrue. Yeah. It's less true than it used to be, but a significant amount of it uh, has either been written or edited by me. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of my, you know, it's my masterpiece almost. <laughs> It's, it's yeah. so like because I'm I'm curious about this right so you so you you had you had the concept you were ready to go with the ready to go with the game right mm -hmm. so you had you had the setting all written up um I'm assuming you decided right we're gonna uh, deliver plot through these things called Winter Fortune what was what was the what was the first game like and then oh, like, be, right you, what do we do now we you give me far too much credit uh, we didn't actually get Winds of Fortune in place until about year three really? uh, <laughs> they came out of an idea that. Uh, that a, a member called Dan Williams had had, and, and Michelle Chessie, Michelle Taylor, sort of worked with them a little bit as well. Uh, prior to that, we did an awful lot of of briefings in packs, um, in that you would pick your pack up and there would be a, a sort of downtime report in it or a, oh, right. a piece okay, of paper yeah. telling you, you know, you are from Bregas Land, Bregas Land is being invaded by flamingos and things imagine, like that. I can imagine the size of those player packs now. Oh, <laughs> uh, and then imagine packing them. Because uh, somebody <laughs> had to put the right piece of paper in the right thing. And that's a legacy of, um, that was a legacy of Maelstrom, which is how we did all our downtime. You would get a little awful, awful short stories worth of text about things that were happening that your character would know about. So for the first event, we did a certain amount of discussion online about what the starting situation was going to be, mm -hmm. um, which you can still see the vaguest shadows on the wiki. So the yeah. first event takes place a few months after Empress Britta has died. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the first big plot event, what would now be a wind of fortune, was the fact that the one of the battles was about recovering Empress Britta's uh, remains and um, and then what to do about them because we built in a tension between uh, Wintermark who wants to put their heroes into the marshes and the Empire who wants to put their thrones into tombs in the necropolis uh, and that was fun that was basically our only plot for event one that was delivered on a large scale everything else we sent out in the much more traditional way of an NPC would go out and talk to people. And we rapidly started to see how challenging it was to send out an NPC to talk to to the people we had on the field and uh, make sure that a plot would spread. Uh, and we looked at various different ways of dealing with that. And eventually we settled on this idea of just telling people what was going on mm -hmm. um, and giving them hints about how they could uh, how they could could deal with that, how they could use the we talk about levers, the the mechanisms that are built into the game for players to be able to to tell us what they want to do and to be able to change things. The the great thing about that, like it really makes you feel like you're getting like the most out of your weekend as well. It means you're not, you don't get that feeling like you've missed something in the sense because you can go out and be like, oh, I know that um, this um, threat is coming and I know what I want to do about it and I can put my campaign forward for it and everything. And I can like, you know, delve into that part of the game and stuff. And it means like, you don't feel like you've like wasted the weekend away or anything by missing things and stuff. Because um, I can't imagine Empire now, like without those wins sitting there to read before going i mean like that's like our entire like drive there is going through the wins and going through well going through all the military last stuff <laughs> last minute studying for us really <laughs> last minute writing down the force waitings on the way <laughs> it, it's interesting i hope uh, well I, I know from talking to people there are different levels of engagement um some people for example only read the winds of fortune that have specifically to do with their nation mm -hmm. um and what that leads to on the field is they are well informed about what's going on in the marches, but people from Dawn and the League and the High Guard get to tell them what's going on in Dawn, the League and High Guard, and they get and they get that sensation of I go I'm part of a world that is very complex and I only interact with the bits of it that come to me. Um, some people don't read any. You can absolutely play Empire by coming in and doing your own thing because there are always proactive people who have read the winds of fortune who will say something like right i need to round up all the priests and get them to vote on this important matter and you we can get dragged into the plot through that and again it makes the players as it were another tool of our plot because they want to achieve things but we've made it difficult to do without talking to other players yeah. um there is a pull up and a push down and a load of complicated mechanisms along those lines that hopefully pull people into the game yeah i gotta admit the fact that you don't have a load of plot to, that you have to learn or a load of rules you have to learn is one of the biggest selling points for us like when we're trying when we're preaching larp to 
to to people one of the biggest things because it's yeah it's, it's a big especially people have never never LARPed before and you're like oh you're gonna come to a field with three thousand people they're like oh yeah and and we're talking about it but one of the biggest selling points is that i'm like hey look you don't you don't need to know anything like you can just show you can just come we'll, we'll get you some kit and like you you just just come as a holiday come as a tourist and you know they just get swept up like robin's dad came like th- this this year um didn't like a little bit too cool for school was like oh i didn't read any of the plot had robin pretty much create his character um by the end he was like well he was like gambling and he was he was getting involved in <laughs> all all sorts. Sorts. he was very much like the first day he's like uh, he was like he, he wanted to tell everyone you know i'm not a nerd or anything i'm just like i'm here because <laughs> my daughter's here so that that's it and he was like you know i won't be coming back and stuff you know i'm just just here for a little holiday and everything by the end of it like oliver said he had gone and discovered parts of the game that i'd never be experienced um but also he did things like that were just quite bracing he was sitting down at military council listening away he then <laughs> went and pulled up a chair at the earl's council and sat and listened to that and then he went off and gambled a load of stuff and then he came back and he was like um i was like oh i'm finally done with all my plot and everything you know do you want to go get a drink and stuff and hang out and he was like uh no i'm gonna go to the Verushkin um uh, market, market now uh, i'll see i'll see you later <laughs> and off he goes with his new friends so i'm like okay <laughs> excellent that is a success story that is, we, is. We, yeah that is a success story i'm really <laughs> pleased by that but that's one of the benefits of anvil as a whole the players doing things creating that um that kind of it, it's almost like a like a faux reenactment uh kind of thing a reenactment village for a history that isn't real um you can go to a night market we don't have to do any work for that night market the players do it all themselves you can go and take in a show at the theater no work from PD is required if you do that. Uh, you can join various meetings. You can go around all those in-character pubs and eating houses and uh, tea shops, and they are actually a net gain because we will regularly, our plot writers will schedule uh, NPCs to take people to these places because they provide oh. excellent in-character venues for you to have a secret chat about the drug trade uh, or what have you. I, uh, yeah, um, it, is, it is one of the highlights. Another one of the highlights of the event is standing at the gate or, or at the top and just looking out across this field of of tents with, with a building or two in Spurs here or there, and these campfires and just loads of people uh, moving around their business, such as it is, whatever that happens to be, and then retiring late or uh, continuing to role play after one o'clock in the morning is also a great success from my point of view. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, I don't think there's, the last few events anyway, I don't think there's been a single event that we've actually stopped role playing at that point. We've just carried on and it's just, it's the atmosphere during the day. It's the fact you can hear kids running around and playing and you see, you know, somebody selling something from a trolley and you see a couple of patrons in the pub just literally sitting, playing a game of cards and chatting. You really do feel like there is just something for everyone. And you feel like the, the, the hardest part, the hardest part about Empire is that drive away from it and that first time you get out the car to put fuel in or you go somewhere and you're, you're like smiling, you have to wave at someone and you're like, oh, back to the real world, I guess. <laughs> that is the hardest part about that game because you are so immersed into that world. Um, oh, But I was wondering about something and this is kind of like circling back to like a um, military council and things. It's something that I was always quite curious about. Now, in military council, of course, on that Friday night, we sit and we argue and we debate um, and we figure out who's going to fight which battle, where they're going, what's going to happen. And we're doing that late on the Friday night. And then by Saturday morning, there's lovely notifications everywhere around the field to tell us who's fighting when. Do you do, 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 do plot stay up late on that Friday night as well, along with us, ready to get everything ready for that next day or do you find out the following morning what's actually happening so um so let me think how this works there's been a few shakers so the people yeah. you want to talk to incidentally is you want to try and get some of the skirmish team in to have a chat about the, all logistics is because i have this very much at second hand uh, i write the winds of war but i learn about the what's going to be happening on saturday and sunday at the same time uh, as the rest of the game team do um at the minute thomas hancock's plays the uh, the prognosticator, he's got a Mero character who goes along to yeah, the yeah. Uh, to the military council meeting and sort of is there dealing with the paperwork and is present to be able to ask questions. Uh, when the military council makes its decision, he comes backstage and tells us 
Uh, and money notionally changes hand as we discover who has won the bet about which battles the players will take. Because we are, <laughs> we, we are never certain, um, and there is nothing more guaranteed to to prove that we've missed something than um, than us thinking we know for sure which battles people are going to take. Um, and then there is there's a I know there's a briefing at I think it's midnight. Um, for the skirmish team for tomorrow to talk to them about what is going to be going on because when we uh, and the main reason I know that is because when we use skirmish team as part of role playing accounts on the field they have this Cinderella clause into their NPC role they have to be back for a certain time so they can get a briefing what's happening so um, the skirmish certainly and the game team are open until uh, we are active until one in the morning um, and while they're getting their skirmish briefings we are usually uh working on our divination responses for the next day because we'll have had in through Leviathan's depths and similar. Uh and they can be a little back and forward then. But we mostly don't have to worry too much about the battles um because they've already the the shape of them and what is going to go on has already been been planned beforehand. And any battle that doesn't get picked kind of gets broken back down into parts and put back in the in the battle writer's toolbox to be pulled back out again for a different battle later on. So nothing gets wasted. Um, the only thing we leave until late is is anything really specific, like uh, if we're going to need weird visions or something, that will often be left until we know we definitely need them. Uh, but we find out at about, let me think, we find out about half an hour after the end of Military Council, which two battles oh, yeah. are going to be taking place the next day. Um, and just about works. So the like the plot is, is it, because um, you're talking about levers, like how reactive is it? compared to uh, like right. okay like because obviously you you have plot like you say you have people like pitching plot you come up with ideas for plot but how reactive to what's happening in the game is it do you like put things in place and wait wait see what happens and so, they have avenues or there's a whole lot of different types of plot first off but i think what we're really talking about here is the kind of thing plot writers write where they say uh there's a cursed standing stone or i've got an idea for a sarcophan family who are selling uh cursed magic items uh to people or um uh, what if some actually drug dealers turn up and are really nice? Uh, and so, um, so some of that is things that have come from the plot writers themselves, but they are often inspired by things they've seen players doing. Um, the synod judgments, for example, are often a, a rich source of ideas because not just the ones that pass with the greater majorities, but the ones that show what players are thinking about. That inspire a plot writer to come up with an idea or they look at an element of the game. Um, uh, Aaron, for example, did uh, was very interested in, con in constellations and how they worked and cool things you could do with them uh, and ran an ambitious plot uh, around those over the last sort of year and a half. And so they will bring those ideas that they have come up with to us. But at the same time, we'll say things like... Um, the plot has led to the destruction of the Vyag. Um, so anybody who's got ideas about ways we can put that on the field, how we can make it real for the players, we want to hear about stuff like that. And here are a sequence of things that are happening that we want to reflect. We want to show the world reacting to, to players doing things. The biggest reflect the world reacting to people is probably the recent Apulian plot, okay. uh, which partly came out of... Uh, things players were doing and then mm -hmm. partly came out of a discussion about where that would go or how that would be interesting to develop. So as much as possible, um, myself and Matt, our end of the plot thing, as towards the reflecting and pulling out ideas that players are pushing about and making the game world real, whereas our plot writers have a little bit more freedom to say, uh, I've had an idea in which Sorin is running a contest. But they still do a kind of... Uh, there's still an element for, for almost all of our plot writers of re reacting and reflecting what players are doing. Mm. We It's not a rule, but our strong guideline is we say, have an idea of the shape of your plot, but only actually plot the event you're about to run. Mm -hmm. Because that way you don't fall in love with the outcome that you want and you are much more able to react to what the players actually do with the thing that you are dealing with. If they smash your... If, uh, Matt uses the One Ring from Lord of the Rings as a perfect example. Uh, in our game, you can absolutely destroy the One Ring in five minutes with a ritual. Yeah. Um, there'll probably be repercussions of that. Because <laughs> all of that power has to go somewhere and throwing it into the volcano is guaranteed to destroy it and destroying it with words of ending might have a terrible negative effect. Mm. But if the plot writer has written a three-volume 
uh, quest plot involving visiting elves in Lothlorien and, uh, uh, and and having fights with giant spiders. It, it can be deeply demoralising when the castle of Radamon decides to just batter the one ring flat and chuck it in the sea. Yeah, hey, we, yeah, we've all been in those uh, in those D and D campaigns, haven't we? Where the the, the yeah. DM has, has written, you know, the magnum opus story, and then you get up for them and they get really annoyed that you haven't uh not engaging with their magnificent story so and it can be a challenge because you've put a, lot, a plot writer has put a lot of effort in an npc has put a lot of characterization in and sometimes the plot gets taken around the back of the sheds and uh, yeah uh and you have to be prepared for that yeah um so all so the I guess like a lot of it is quite like um obviously getting that initial like you said that initial idea and then after that first event it's quite reactive to what the players are actually doing with it and how much they're interacting with it and stuff because yeah i mean there's definitely been things that have come up in the game that like every everything that i've interacted with has been absolutely in incredible and i'm just like wow it's amazing and everything and then like after especially it's been like a skirmish and stuff because um like i had a skirmish where i had to kill this person and um it failed three times beforehand and i was like i'm throwing everything i'm throwing two mass calls at this thing it is the first skirmish of the night i'm going to obliterate it and we did it in three minutes and i was like i have missed something we are staying <laughs> here until we can... everyone was knackered because we just started chasing druge around oh we all, yeah we almost and died and everything because we, we were almost like, died we around because too we long kept, and... we stayed there i was like no we we, we must have missed something we're staying here and then it, I was weeks afterwards, I was like, if I missed something, I, I've not interacted with the plot correctly. I've done something wrong. And it wasn't until the outcome came out and I found out, oh, oh, we killed them straight away. We could have gone home 25 minutes before we actually <laughs> did. <laughs> so it is it is a, a time a time of recording. We are in January, right? So do you, is this your time for your like you've got a long respite now because i imagine there's a lot of uh you have to do a lot of work very quickly in between events or is uh, it or is it a lot of work gearing up for the year ahead so we talk about winter um which is basically post e4 till uh till around now till the start of the next year um that is our time period for doing maintenance and looking at stuff i'm in the middle of a long overdue um review of our curses in the game there's a couple of niggly bits about them they're not working as well as they could do uh we want to do a little shake up on them yeah. um while uh graham is looking at certain rules things that aren't quite right uh and matt is looking at um matt is looking at stuff around some of the core right principles of, of some areas of the game um and uh claire is working on making the player event process a little bit more streamlined a little bit more responsive um, so we will be bringing that, I want to say to a close, but I've met us, we will be pushing that down in its priority a little bit towards the end of January, um, which is when I'll start meeting up with plot writers to talk about what we're going to do at event one and to have some chats about rough plans for the year. Um, what's going to be a... so Because at a really basic level, we have two kinds of plot. We have a one-and-done plot, which is something interesting that happens at event one and then is probably over unless something goes wrong with it or somebody will or we will be pitching an arc or pitching the next step in an arc uh for a plot like um i don't want to give any proper examples but but the perhaps there's a conspiracy <laughs> in the league to devalue the pork prices yeah. that has been that started halfway through last year as a one of and has developed a little bit and this and we'll talk about what is going to happen at event one with some vague ideas of what will happen event two and three the plot writers go away they do all the hard work writing it up we then will have another meeting in the last couple of weeks before the event uh, in which we finalise stuff and dot T's and cross I's uh, with any additional meetings in the process there. That's what I'll be doing. Matt and Graham will be dealing with their own areas of the game. Claire will be making sure we've got all the right number of egg doors that we need for everything and uh, uh, and dealing with the inevitable people who've had to move to Australia in the middle of a civil case and all that sort of stuff. Mm. So right now we're kind of in that, uh, in a long post-Christmas liminal state, yeah, where we are, where we're not quite focused on our 
uh, on our maintenance stuff and not quite moved into the active, we've got her an empire in like six weeks or however long it is. It must be longer than that. It's about eight or nine, 12. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> weeks we have. It comes round <gasps> quick, you know, it comes round. But, but, we are, but we are already moving into that one. So, for example, a couple of weeks ago, uh, downtime finally closed. Uh, map process downtime. I know the outcomes of all the battles. Um, I've started putting the framework together for Winds of War. Uh, we've had the meeting we have to talk about things like um, what have been the big impacts, how to present things, the potential drama and stuff. So we're already moving into the preps for event one. So do you have, do you have an idea of how many, because you, you seem to have a sort of a, a, a set number of Winds of War sort of, but the Winds of Fortune, it was, it, do you have to just write as many as you need or you just go? So... Um, <sighs> Winds of War is usually one full write-up for every significant area of the game. Um, it's been skewed a little bit for this upcoming event because of the cold sun, uh, meaning there's a lot more theatres. But I want to make sure that each one of those individual theatres gets its own attention because there are some there are some interesting differences between the ways things are happening in different parts of the game. So we're going to look. I think we're looking at our largest number of Winds of War that I've ever written. Uh, but hopefully it won't be more text because some of them will be will be shorter than others. Who knows? It'd be fun to find out. I have no idea. And then when it comes to Winds of Fortune, um, we have a few, we have like half a dozen mandatory ones that we do every time, plenipotentiary responses, uh, the Winds of Magic at the end, the trade winds, the people coming to Anvil stuff. Um, and then we we'll, we'll have, we've got a list, basically, of the Winds of Fortune that we should write and as time goes on, that list will collapse down or somebody will say, uh, what if we roll these two ideas in together to bring out this theme instead? Um, but it is usually a surprise how many Winds of Fortune we actually have, uh, what those Winds of Fortune are, uh, where they go, all of that stuff. We aim, uh, Matt and I disagree on the exact number, but we aim for around somewhere between 20 and 25. More than that is too many. Yeah, it's uh, but in terms of sheer words um every time i've worked it out it comes in at about the length of a short novel um charlie the chocolate factory i think is the one that we hit most uh most commonly we do that four times a year <laughs> yeah 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 so like so it, it, there's a big difference then between your it, like e, e1 and two and two and yeah so, so between between those those blocks in between there's a lot less time to write all those oh yeah yeah absolutely. Fortune. so what's your what what's the process like as soon as you come home from the event what's, uh, what's the process in theory we start straight away in practice we have about a week mm -hmm. uh while we wait for downtime to close and then we drive ourselves mad writing uh, all the winds of fortune for the next event mm. uh there's a, i'd love it to be more sophisticated than that but it yeah. but it broadly isn't yeah. we can't um, the best we get is sometimes we cut a wind of fortune from the previous event because it's either not working out and will take too much effort to get it to work right, or it turns out less pressing, and that will often start, and that will be the first wind of fortune we get done for the next event because we're able to repurpose it. But at the end of the day, we just write them. Um, it's one of the reasons we used to worry a little bit about the fact event one would have more plot at it than events two, three, and four, because we have more time to write the Winds of Fortune. But actually, a lot of those Winds of Fortune are setting up things that will run through the year or recapping things that were running last year. So I think it just about works out. Um, the key worry I have all the time with Winds of Fortune is we're writing too much and putting people off because they feel like there's too much homework to do. But I think we still managed to keep it to we so much keep to the idea of there are large numbers of winds of fortune you do not need to read if you are not in that nation well like you said if yeah. you've got thousands of people someone's <laughs> going to have read it <laughs> but but we're up against very realistic realistically uh, where the very real problems of things like fomo of people who feel like they're not committing entirely if they don't read a novel's worth of charlie the chocolate factory's worth of complex sometimes very complex political social and legal stuff yeah yeah, I mean, I, I, st I still, I mean, I've been playing the game for two years and I still like sometimes like, right, I, I am interested in this one and I'll, I'll read it. And then sometimes I'm still like following wiki links to be like, wait, hang on, wait, what, what place is that? You know, what, um, what, what, ca what character is this? What are they referencing here? I have no idea what that is. And then you end up reading, I end up reading like 
four times as much as I intend to go read because I end up going back, which is which is good because I'm I'm learning yeah. at the same time. But that's usually what what happens when someone re like looks at that bit of text for the first time. Uh, you can sometimes incidentally guess whether it's me or Matt that has written as opposed to edited the bulk of a window fortune based on how many wiki links there are in it. Uh, because I'm very enthusiastic about linking everything <laughs> into weaving it all into the I into the that. fabric of empire, I whereas that. Matt yeah. is often much more focused on the here, right here, right now, what is happening stuff. Um, yeah, no, so I... if, you've, if you've been lost down a wiki hole, it's probably my fault for yeah. linking every term to somewhere else on the wiki. No, yeah, well, that's I... we need that though. Yeah, like honestly, like especially when you're learning and stuff. Like I'm, I'm one of the people that I, I can't, I can't read um a huge amount before it. So I kind of go to the bits that I really need to focus on. But by doing that, the links that you're putting in there, it means uh, if I'm like, oh yeah, you know. The Druze have sent a such and such. I'm like, what what the hell is that? You know, and then I can follow that link and be like, oh, that's that specific type of Druze. Okay, now I know that piece of information. And not everyone that I know in the field is gonna know that piece of information. And you can share it on the field when you're trying to put things forward and stuff. It is um, yeah, but I I I am trying, I'm trying it's, to get it, through it. <laughs> it's got its pros and cons, uh, but the pro I like to focus on is it's made politics and history and the hard skills similar to the ability to fight or speak in public. Mm -hmm. um, yes. We haven't got a skill like current affairs or history where you would just say, I've got history, what does this mean? We say, mm -hmm. if we drop a reference to Emperor Frederick and you don't know who Emperor Frederick is, you can find somebody who does know who Emperor Frederick is and they can give you a piece of information that puts things into a new form of context. And it's another reason for you to seek people out. Things like the Anvil Library, for example, can help out a lot yes. with them where there you have an in-character thing run entirely by players um, that is a, a starting point for if you've got an obscure question about law you want to go and ask somebody. Uh, I really like that. I've also been really pleased with the work um, Empire Audio has been doing, um, recording yeah. the Winds of Fortune and the Winds of War increases the number of people who can access uh, access them easily yeah yeah no, we, we had we had autumn on it's funny you said about you can tell who's who's writing that's one thing autumn did say or you can you can tell the different the different writing styles but also yeah it's uh it i, I know you because because you guys are up to the up to the mark sometimes on those on those wins aren't you and you're like right get get them out and it's like the day before or something and autumn's like oh i, I need, they need to record We've, record <laughs> I like to say we've got better. Um, we will generally have the, all the winds of fortune up by the time we're leaving to, for site. Yeah. 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 Because obviously lot to do. is better than where yeah. we started, where we yeah. put them up on Friday. Yeah. And in five weeks, there's a lot of information to get out there. You know, it's, it's a lot of, like you said, you know, writing a small, a small, a small novel in that five weeks, you know, um, and making sure it's not, because it's not just a creative bit of writing either, is it? It's something that you have to be like, you have to make sure that you're covering all the, covering all the bases, aren't you? It's interesting. We have a lot of different, a uh, window fortune serves a lot of purposes for every in-depth, what are you going to do about the sword scholars? Uh, in which there are loads of moving parts and little things that we need to make sure people don't miss uh, and things like that. There'll be a, um, a a guy with his top off has been projected three hundred feet tall onto the clouds of the Mornwald, and this is causing some excitement in the Mornwald. Um, and that doesn't need a load of additional things. That just needs a. Like, this has happened. It's weird. Here are some viewpoints that people have got on it, and and things you could poke with a stick. Um, and then we do everything in between. Yeah. Um, which hopefully, again, makes it easy for people to find something that they are interested in yeah. that doesn't require them to know the entire history of the Sword Scholar re, uh, uh, return. Yeah. How, how yeah. big? Oh, exactly, yeah. 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 Um, sorry, go for it, yeah. No, no, you, you go ahead, Robin. No, I was going to say, so like, um, obviously, like you said, we've got there, we've got, we've got our four main Empire events a year and you do all this work in between them with our plot and things, but we've also got things like our player events. Um, and I'm right in saying we get our sanctioned and our unsanctioned events. Um, I, I've never <laughs> fully understood this, okay? So like, we're, in the middle of changing really the, <laughs> we're in the middle of changing the terminology on that because it's been driving me mad since I first spotted it. <laughs> so sanctioned means PD has said that this player event is fine and you can run it and go to it. Okay. Unsanctioned means PD thinks that this event has problems and you shouldn't go to it. But we've used sanctioned event to mean an event that has plot at it. Uh, yeah. And an unsanctioned oh. event to mean an event that hasn't got anything on. So one of the things I'm, uh, I've been, well, Claire and Steve have been doing the work and I just do the wiki updates. Um, we're changing that to plot event and social event. 
um, because I think that immediately should hopefully make it a little bit more easily. Both social events and plot events could be sanctioned or unsanctioned. And the difference is a social event you don't really need to tell us about. If all you're planning to do is get a bunch of characters together in a in a in a in a bathhouse or a water park uh, to role play with one another, that is fine. Go for it. That is what the game is designed to support. If you want NPCs or monsters or plot or magic items or anything like that, you effectively you work with us in the same in a similar way to which we'd work with our own plot writers to just double check that all that stuff fits into the game. That yeah. that there's no glaring errors. That you're not. You've not missed something. You're not taking the mickey. We will often make suggestions like you could do it like this, but have you considered doing it like this? Because if you look at these two pages, this constellation has a lot more in common with the themes of your event than this constellation does, uh, but it's less popular. So you may not have spotted it. That's um, that's really that's cool that you put that input into them. You know, <laughs> I, I just assume that people would just be like, hey, I want to run this event. You know, what do you think? And you just go yes or no. Uh, so it's one of the it's one of the repercussions of having a closed world in which everything matters. Um, because anything that happens at a player event could, in theory, impact a main event. There have been some beautiful examples of that. Um, there was an event called No Return, um, sort of four or five years ago now, which was a which was mostly, but not only a Navarre event in Thurunin, um, in which the machinations of Yorna Gra were exposed. That 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 particular Eternal was trying to rouse up the um, the Valon of Thurunin, uh, and the event itself, the award-winning No Return, um, had all sorts of really cool things going on. It, but it fired up the Navarre, and they turned back up to the event, and they got Yorna Gra enmitied, and that led into the Rise oh. of the Heirs of Terran and all this sort of thing, um, and that worked partly because the the theme that the runner of that particular event was dealing with was one that was already in the game that was already being. Uh, looked at it. Yorna Gra was being a little bit dubious. But you also see things like there was a uh, a player event called, uh, was it Triage 1 or 2? One of the two hospital events. Okay. There was a piece okay. of plot in which one of the re one of the ways to resolve that plot was to make a deal with the Whisper Gallery. And the players chose to, to set the deal with the Whisper Gallery and it became common knowledge. And a dozen players or more were declared sorcerers in one long conclave session. And I think one of them only had their sorcery overturned uh, last event or the event before. So really? years of having been sorcery because of a result of it. Um, so because there is that potential for things like that to happen, we want to look at your plot. We want to make sure you haven't put a shotgun in or uh, or, or made a, a misconception about what a dragon is or how it works. Um at the minute, Steve Kirkbride is doing most of that, which is great because yeah. um, because it's useful to have somebody else doing it. And then we'll get back in contact by email, or we will. Uh, we had a Discord meeting with one of the uh, runners of one of the upcoming events, sort of like uh, the other night, sort of Thursday night, just to talk through stuff when it's too complicated for a for an email. And it's yeah. and it's good. And it's lovely. Yeah. Um, player events are an opportunity for people uh, to do things in Empire that we can't do because we run in a field. Um, we can't run an event at Bathhouse. No. <laughs> well, we can, but it's a lot more effort for us. Than, you know. yeah. I'm not sure we could. The Sentinel Gate is great, but getting people to, I don't know, bath so that they can spend uh, spend three hours talking philosophy in a bathhouse is a little beyond us. Yeah. Um, Varushka has a load of really nice horror themes built into it, scary mm. woods and weird monsters. And it's quite hard for us to create that atmosphere for a large number of people in a scout tent scout field full of three well, sorry in a large field full of three thousand people but much easier if you've hired an out of the way cottage in the woods uh with secret passages in it i like that about it we wrote several things into the game in fact with the knowledge that they would inspire player events rather than be anything we could use ourselves uh varushka and its sovereigns is one of those examples yeah yeah because oh, wow. I, I know they cause they ran there was there was events running when there was the big adventure into uh, off to Terunial, there was like the people went, oh yeah, it's it's a it's basically a, a, a downtime that was a you know it was going to be a wins and people went oh you know um, so so do you like uh, I guess that yeah that inspires you to write things into like wins of wins of fortune and things like that wins of we don't do it a lot for the same reason that while I've given examples of where player events have bled through into a main event it's not an automatic thing. Um, uh, if we're aware of something and we'll sometimes put it in, most plot writers, most people running a player event that has plot in it are sensible enough to let us know how it went. 
Um, and if something stands out there, we might uh, we might ask if we can pick it up and run with it. Um, but we are not we're not short of plot no, ourselves. No. Uh, so it's not common. But what does happen is people bring the experiences they've had at the player event back to the main field. And that is, I think, the really good way that both social and plot events uh can impact what's happening at Anvil. People have 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 interacted with each other with people they might not otherwise talk to because they want to a player event, or they've been exposed to an idea they might not have otherwise done, or they've formed an opinion about Uh, about something and that works really nicely because it makes everything a little richer yeah i suppose you gotta you gotta worry about like uh like fomo thing as well like cause if you if you make the player events too like oh yeah if you run a player event and there's this important plot then you've got only you know what a, a few dozen people going to that event and the player base is is thousands strong so you don't want to be like oh yeah this there was this really important thing that happened you know in this scottish castle that 40 people went to you know Uh, yes, absolutely. And it's one of the reasons, like I say, that, that while they do sometimes bleed over, they usually don't. I also find, I, I think it is better to run a player event where you're not expecting it to bleed over because then your whole focus is on the event you're actually running. Uh, and we, we encounter that problem all the time. We have to keep reminding ourselves to focus on the event we're about to run, not what might happen in two events' time. Because we're only running, we can only run one event at, at the time uh, until such time as we, you know, get time travel technology. Um, so, uh, and where player events are really strong, in my opinion, is when they are an enclosed, contained weekend experience, mm -hmm. um, like a like a one shot D and D game, but you get to take your ongoing D and D character to it. Yeah. Uh, and we've seen some really good examples of those as well. Uh, over the course of the years, some high concept strangeness is the best way to describe them. Uh, and we sort of look at them and say, this is never going to work, but if it does, it's going to be great for everybody involved. And it almost invariably is great for everybody involved yeah. um, oh, no, as they yeah. play around with philosophy. I think uh, one of the, there was one where the Eternal Elenrith kidnapped a bunch of people to run experiments on them. And we were like, okay, bit high context concept, but, I think we can make it work and you're right. It makes sense. And we look forward to finding out how it goes. Oh, that's really cool though. Yeah. That's really <laughs> cool. Again, I thought it was just like a, a, a yes or no thing. And it, I'm, I think it's probably good that you're clearing up the whole sanction unsanctioned. To be honest, for, for me, I thought, I kind of thought just unsanctioned sanction when I first heard of it was like Canon and non-Canon if you like it, it was yeah i kind of thought like if i die an unsanctioned event i'm not actually died and if i die a, like, that's literally how i was kind of like computing it in my brain i was like i, don't, oh, I, I don't, think that's what it means but i, I don't think sure. we've ever had an unsanctioned event it's more a should it come up we will say can't do this because one of the things you could do incidentally if you really want to is is just because our rules are creative commons and our setting is creative commons you can just run your own empire event that has no connection to our main events and as long as nobody, everybody's aware of the fact that it's just a bit of fun you're doing. If somebody wanted to run, we joke about this from time to time, um, about running a Mirror Universe Empire player event uh, in which some key historical event has turned out differently and now all the good people are bad and all the bad people are good. If you wanted to run that as a player event, um, as long as you're not, as long as you just are clear that it is a bit of fun using the Empire world and rules, we don't need to know about it. We look forward to hearing your war stories. Uh, but as long as everybody knows that it's not an actual event that is happening in character between main events go for your lives yeah oh yeah because, because there's people i mean I, I guess obviously people people do um the right songs tell stories but yeah people are playing like ttrpgs and things like that like in, in yeah, the empire absolutely. setting and things like that you know um yeah. we uh we still talk we very nearly we, we, i was discussing it before the pandemic and it's sort of sorry before lockdown and then it all fell off a bit but we had some vague plans about a yotan event Uh, it could be quite fun. I was chatting with some people about possibly doing that. that it would be a not be a, a player event in a sanctioned, unsanctioned context, but people could just play Yelton for the weekend. Yeah, that planning is... how they're going to defeat their terrible enemies, the Empire. Yeah, that that is one that comes up a lot when people talk about <laughs> like that. fun <laughs> player events that people could do. I've heard people, a lot of people say, "Oh yeah, you know, it'd be fun to like play, you know, have Druge characters or have." Or have Jotun characters, you know that that is that is the the, the temptation, like you said, because the game is so set and it's like, okay, well, you're 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 playing the Empire and this is the, you know, the, the, these are the enemies. In fact, actually, on that, is there a is there a, a favorite uh, faction that you like writing for? Oh, uh, so uh, good question. Um, there are three, uh, each one in a different area. Yeah. I very much enjoy writing March of flavor text. Nice. 
Uh, I like the marches. I like the feel of them. I like the earthiness. Um, uh, uh, heavily inspired by the Tiffany Aching books by uh, by Terry Pratchett, my appreciation. Oh, okay, Um, yeah, uh-huh. Okay, okay. but with an honourable mention to both the League and Horizon, who the League in particular is really fun to write sarcasm and and irony and conversations with. That's a lot of fun. Um, I enjoy writing the Thule. Um, of the four barbarians, I very much enjoy writing the Thule, um, because they have that oh, older than you kind of feel to them, that world weary. We've seen it all before. We're terrible people, but we've also got bad backs, kind of feel, which I really enjoy. And of the actual foreign nations, um, I get a lot of fun out of the Assyrians. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Really like writing the Assyrians, who are dreadful on every level, gleefully dreadful. Uh, on every level, and uh, and are a lot of fun to write for and to write plots around. I had an immense amount of fun <coughs> doing, uh, putting my GCSE French to the test, uh, playing a character called Almodinostikis on the field, the Assyrian architect, Okay. uh, when he was inquisitioned for the fact that he kept putting statues of Assyrian gods on imperial buildings. And I had immense amounts of fun doing an absolutely outrageous French accent And uh, random words I could remember from GCSE English, and that is that is uh, that is heaven as an NPC role, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> um, the fact that the ambassador at the time, I believe, was an honest to goodness French person who was forced to sit through me uh, plundering my GCSE French um, was certainly a challenge, and also added extra enjoyment to the entire scene. I, 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 someone said this to me, or I read, I read it on a comment. Is it, is it true that you've got like you, you've got the different languages implemented into the system? So if someone comes and literally speaks French or something, then that is a So it was an ambitious idea of Max yeah. that we would write in the languages, and now let me think how we work this out, the languages of the places that do LARP who might, in theory, come to Empire. Yeah. So that's why we have German and Norwegian and French and Dutch, because they were four strong contenders for people to come across. And then we had... Uh, Eastern European, it was a little bit more generic. This was an ancient time where we weren't quite as sensitive about this sort of thing. Uh, and Matt said, let's make those languages uh, diegetic to the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, partly, again, as a reaction to Maelstrom, where we tried to run a game in which there was only a single language. Mm, yeah. Um, that basically, because of the way the world was made, everybody spoke the same language. Mm. And then people started asking questions like, so where does souvenir come from? Because that's clearly not from the same root as these other words. How can... How can this group of people have a word that doesn't mean that sort of means dragon, but isn't dragon? How does that work? And so we went the other way and said, <laughs> where world languages exist, where possible, we'll give them a context. Um, and then it means that if you and your friend are both fluent French speakers, you can in character communicate with each other. And the only people who can understand what it is that you're saying are other people who have got hard skill French. And you all know that in character, you're speaking one of the Assyrian languages. So on that level, it works. Where it falls apart is, I can count on the fingers of one foot the number of Russian crew members we have, uh, which immediately caused just no end of problems. And we've been working around it ever since. Um, but in theory, yes, the Commonwealth is a German nation. The German language comes from that part of the globe. Yeah, yeah. It's a cool little factoid, though, and because because it's like a re like you know you don't have again in the in the rule set of the game, people aren't that the players aren't from anywhere other than the empire, you know. So obviously, the rarity of people. Walk, talk, you know, walking around talking those languages is should be. Uh, rare. I think our actual rule is you can have a character who is from or is a first generation descendant of people from a nation Oh, if you're okay. fluent in the language, but you must now be part of the empire. Yeah. So um, there's an obvious example. One of the the ambassador to Jam for a while uh, was um, Erichter, was a Polish player um, who. who played a former Jarmish emigre, but she was part of Urizen. She was an Urizen character. Um, she had in-character connections to Jarm. Mm -hmm. It's tricky and difficult because one thing we don't have is we don't write up the foreign nations to the same degree of uh, information as we put out for the imperial nations. And in theory, 
each one of the five for big foreign nations, the ones that don't speak imperial as their first language, are as complex as the empire is. They have as many, many factions within them. They've got loads of different languages, and they are intentionally yeah. um, abstracted as much as we possibly can, and that can create the odd challenge yeah. for playing a character connected to them. Because I imagine, because like the player, obviously the, the player base, could we call ourselves the empire? I'm assuming there's other empires, right, out in the in the world. So we've been pretty. Uh, not not strict on it exactly. So there are. So we talk about them. Thank you, Alexa. Um, <laughs> Alexa just reminded me to drink some water because I've been coughing. Uh, bless my partner. Um, so where was I? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, we talk about uh, two different kinds of nations. There's the locals, um, who are people like Faradun, the Iron Confederacy, Axos. They are close to the empire, uh, and in some cases, you could walk to them. Yeah. Um, in, in almost all cases, you can okay. walk to them. And they are local. They all speak English as their first language, and they are in, interested in the same things that the Empire is. And the Empire can, in theory, um, go to war with them or, or fight them or invade them or what have you. And then we have the, the Great Powers, who are the other big nations that are far enough away that you are never going to send a navy to invade them, and neither are they going to send a navy back. And conceptually, each one of them... The same uh, when you all get together in a field at Anvil for a weekend, they are doing something similar back in their own nations. Um, Three thousand of their movers and shakers are getting together to decide what what the Commonwealth armies are going to be spending their mithril on this weekend and things like that. And each one of them is surrounded by a penumbra of smaller nations, but we very intentionally don't look at them too closely because that is not where the game is. That no, we don't no. Want, no. we don't want the well, yeah, in theory, the empire should have uh, dozens of ambassadors for loads of little countries and uh, and even quite large countries. But that simply, but but that would diffract and distract too much from what is going on in the field in front of us. Um, so the great nations are over there playing their own game, and they're only relevant at the point where they where it intersects for whatever reason with well, the game. Yeah, because yeah, you've got that nice kind of Tolkien esque kind of like the the world map isn't filled out. Like it's like you, you know that even like the you know when we push out, you know it's like oh what's the other side of the Malum? We don't we don't know. You've got a nice little kind of fog of war going on out there mm. where it's it's not just like oh I can see the entire the entire map. Oh what's this over there? I want to go there. Let's talk about this. Talk about that. You you can kind of concentrate the story into that area. Um, map sort of points out from time to time that it's not a game of exploration. Um, again, M Maelstrom was a game in which exploration played a theme and man was that a pain in the backside because making new exciting places interesting is a full-time job. Uh, as anybody who's ever tried to populate a hex crawl can tell you, um, which Maelstrom tried to do, it tried to put points of interest in in a map that was thousands of miles across in both directions and yeah. it was very tricky. Yeah, yeah. Also, also, you want to keep the mystery. I guess, I guess, you know, the the like the game isn't like a main character game anyway, and you you don't really want someone coming in making a character. It's like, oh, I'm I'm a, a prince from Jam or whatever, and I've, <laughs> I've 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 come and you know, and I'll, let me tell you all about this country. You know, I guess I guess that's the, the reason why you don't want people making characters. Yeah, absolutely. All the different um, nations, all the different barbarian nations, and everything. Uh, focusing on the empire means. It is always better saying I'm a I'm a disgraced prince who's had to flee Jam, but I, I don't want to talk about that. I want to focus on the fact that I'm now uh, an imperial citizen. But incidentally, I like to get advice from astrologers, uh, and I have a load of artwork depicting tiny elephants. Um, is absolutely fine. That's yeah. taking some things everybody knows about yeah. Jam uh, and making them a little bit of a character hook for your yeah. uh, league character. Yeah. Um, but 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 trying to play a Jarmish prince in exile isn't going to work in Empire. Yeah, yeah, because you, like you say, you you can put those elements. But the ones who I, the the people that I really like um, who do this well are the Imperial Orcs, where they 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 have like that ancestry of oh yeah, like I'm an Imperial, but my ancestors were were Druze or they were Jotun, and they can like add that little kind of flavor every now and again. Yeah, no, like it's also I I love the fact though that. We're there, and yeah, there's all these like ideas and stuff you can come up with with the character and things like that. But this is not Dungeons and Dragons, and we are focusing on this threat that is right here now. We have our borders; they are getting threatened, and we need to actually focus on. There's a reason that us specifically have gone to Anvil. We're the ones that are dealing with this threat. Why would we be concerned about something that is nowhere near us at the minute and isn't an immediate threat? It, it feels so focused on 
mainly because the part of the game I see is military council, but it seems so focused on that immediate uh, stuff. I, I was going to say, you, you actually identified something there. You, your main part of the game you see is military council. Yeah. But while you're talking about how important it is to defend the borders, I'm thinking, uh, is, it, <laughs> is it really that important to defend the borders? How threatened are the Navarre at the minute? Uh, for example, they don't have a coastline. The Grendel can't get to them. The Jotun have to go through either Wintermark or the Yot or the Marches to get to uh, Hercinia, the Thule yeah. East. Why would they worry necessarily about the defence of the borders? Why would the priest, whose main concern is ensuring that the Empire's current conflict between uh, the ideas of virtue and liberty. How does liberty fit into virtue? I might think that is the more pressing question than what happens, because I just assume the military council will sort all that out uh, one way or another. Um, why would I, in Dawn, care what happens ultimately? I mean, it's important, but the Grendel and the Jotun don't threaten Dawn. Yeah. They're unlikely to threaten Dawn until the entire empire is in flames. It's the Druge, however, are right there right now. Yeah. Um, and that is something we very intentionally built in. One of the earliest seeds of Empire came from a thought experiment Matt and I were doing very late at night while driving the length of the country to go to an event in which Matt was talking about how cool it would be to create a game in which everybody is initially united against an outside threat, but that about event three or so, the outside threat is defeated. Mm -hmm. uh, and the main, the actual game is much closer to the fourth age of Middle-earth. What do you do after the unified factor is gone? Uh, and we talk a little bit about how during the first year, the military council was absolutely united because they believed that the orcs were a monolithic threat that if they were not defeated and not resisted by the entire empire would wash across the whole empire. But towards but at the start of year two, and as year two went on, more people started to twig that the orcs are actually quite divided um, that and that you could worry about the orcs who are on your border and completely ignore the orcs on other people's borders. And the more resources you can suck out of the empire to the defense of your nation, the more stable and safe it will be and the more popular you will be. And you can, in theory, screw those other nations if you really want to. And that's kind of when the when when the, the PvP elements of our of our game really started to get into, into their stride. Because lots of different people have very different ideas about what the most important thing to do right now is. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it is interesting. I, I do. I, that's, that's the thing you have, you have your own opinions, but like these, a lot of these people that you're coming to Anvil with, and it's obviously it's representing us all gathering in one place. Like these, these characters are my character's friends now, but we, but and then, but then they're more passionate. Like you said, I have my marcher friends that are on the other side of the map <laughs> to, to me. Like you say, we're talking about the Grendel. Everyone's going, the, the Grendel, the Grendel, the Grendel. And we're like, I'm like, well, I know I'm landlocked here, so I'm not. <laughs> not, 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 not <laughs> I think you literally said that in character oh, yeah, last did, yeah. event. I think you literally went, "Well, <laughs> well we're landlocked. We're going to go and carry on with the drift." I was like, "Well, if if they if if, if they push, they get out of the water and push their ships to Asla, I'll start being worried." But you know, <laughs> well, what that does is it creates another great opportunity for people to interact with each other. I don't really care about the Grendel. What I care about is um is is i don't know re revoking mm -hmm. uh the minister for historical affairs because well you don't need to know why i want to revoke him so what we'll do is i'll help you against the grendel if you help me against yeah, the minister for historical that. affairs yeah there, there is a lot um, of that yeah and that is the basis of, of a large amount of our politics people we've got enough in the game enough things for you to ambitious about enough things you to care about in character that other people don't care about that you can drag people into your uh into your machinations and get caught up in conspiracies yeah Excellent. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So do you do you have like an like an R and R character that you play at the events? Do you ever like play a character and go around and just you know? So so. I do. Uh, I do a couple of NPCs. I'm not as mobile yeah. as I used to be. Um, I have a few NPC roles that uh, most of the NPC crew have got an NPC role or two that they are currently doing. Um, I do. Um, so Dogwar is the closest I get to an R&R &R character yeah. because when he's actually in front of you being an Eternal, 80% um, of what he's doing is listening to other players and nodding um, because the bits of it where where both plot is taking place don't uh, usually take place off stage or behind scenes or in a small group with two or three people. Um, so that is the closest I get to an R&R &R character. I'll go out and I will have a party uh, with, the, uh, with the Magicians of the Empire because that is um what that character has devolved into um if i absolutely have to go onto the field in character i will often shove on my uh civil service outfit that is a character 
uh, all the members of the game team have got to have a civil servant character who is notionally their constitutional court member. Yeah. So if you see Graham on the field, he's almost certainly playing uh, Gerard de Salle, the, um, the imperial accountant. Matt is often out as his highborn uh, magistrate and constitutional scholar, Abraham, and I take Leontes the scribe, uh, the, the surliest member of the civil service, uh, and the uh, imperial archivist, the historian, out onto the field. So those are the closest I get to an R&R character. But I always try and make a point of playing... Uh, some NPCs every event who are not those two characters, um, just to keep my fingers in. Yeah, yeah. so you're right. Right before we uh, wrap up, Andy, is there anything you want to uh, plug, say, on behalf of PD yourself? Any any projects? Anything you want to? Uh, no, say not you got massively. Uh, I've got a Patreon in which I uh, write fiction and occasionally talk about what I'm doing. But you can probably find that yourselves if you're interested. Yeah, I'll put a link down below. Yeah. Go check. All it right. Out. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's largely it. Um, the big project I've got coming up is a, is a quartet of large uh, fest events, uh, which will be taking place over the coming year called Empire. Um, <laughs> that is broadly what I'm doing. Yeah. We've got a little video of our own coming out about PvP at some point when we can finally get it edited. Uh, but that will be all over the uh, the Empire Lab thing. Um, I've really enjoyed myself. Thank you. It's, it's lovely to it's, talk about Empire. Hey, hey it's, it's been an absolute uh, absolute pleasure, Andy. We appreciate you very much. Um, we'll Good. say goodbye to the audience in the podcast. See you later, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you very much for stopping by. If you enjoyed this show, leave us a comment, give us a like, subscribe, and follow so you know when a new episode is posted. If you want more information on Profound Decisions and what Andy does, if you want to check out Andy's Patreon as well and follow his socials, all the relevant links are down below uh, also you can go check out some of our other videos that we have done on larp all of our podcasts are available all of our back catalog is available go check out our patreon if that interests you give us a five-star review on audio platforms such as itunes and spotify until the next time though we love you very much and stay safe